How's it going? My name is Dave, uh, and I am a front-end developer who has spent uh, a better part of the last couple of years um, doing training opportunities for back-end developers and for people that are new to front-end web development. Uh, and I've given this talk about front-end engineering at uh, a couple of conferences, and somebody asked me if I would do a recording. So uh, I figured, what the heck, let's give it a shot. Um, so you want to be a front-end engineer, uh, is the title of my talk. And uh, I think that that distinction deserves some explanation uh, because not everyone would call themselves a front-end engineer, and I think that there is an important distinction. Uh, and I think to understand that, you have to first really look at um, the evolution that every developer goes through, or at least the evolution that I went through. So there's this place that I started at. I, I came out of a design background. Uh, I didn't start as a developer. Um, and I kind of went through this devolution, as I've so cleverly called it, where you know I started as a designer. Um, and I got into the web early in 1997 when tables were all the rage for layout and GeoCities was the place to, to do things. Um, and, you know, I kind of dove into print design. I had Photoshop and was interested in that, but of course I wanted to create a web page. And so uh, I went through that process of, of tinkering with HTML and with CSS and really trying to figure out how I could translate my print designs the best that I could uh, from Photoshop to uh, the, the browser. And that involved using a lot of tables just because it was the easiest way to translate a grid layout at that time. And so I started as a designer, and um, maybe you started as a designer, but maybe not. Maybe you started as a developer, but you wouldn't call yourself a developer to start. You call yourself a hacker. Uh, and I think the distinction there is, you know, a hacker can come up with solutions, but uh, maybe they can't look back after they finished and realize how they came up with the solution. They just kind of poke at things until they get something that works. Um, and so, you know, I started designer, you might have started as a hacker, um, and at some point you, you level up and you, you become a developer. And what's the distinction between designer and hacker and developer? Well, I think developer understands best practices. Um, they've heard other developers say things like, um, you should put your scripts at the bottom of the web page. They've heard, you know, maybe it's not even related to web development. You've just heard other people say things that are best practices, and so you can repeat those to other devs. But you use those best practices, you craft solutions, but you don't really understand beneath the best practices, beneath the abstractions, so to speak. And so I think that really is what separates uh, developers from engineers. An engineer is somebody that um, can, can get things done, they can craft a solution, uh, they understand the best practices, but they also understand why they're using the best practices that they are. And so I think that uh, that's really the distinction that I'm making here. Um, as front-end developers, we want to move from just sort of being able to repeat or regurgitate all of the best practices that we've heard and move into really an understanding of uh, the platform as a whole, the browser, um, and why we regurgitate and we repeat those best practices to other people. Really, we just solve problems, uh, as our TF2 engineer buddy can point out. So when I was researching, uh, I first gave this talk at Star Trek in Columbus, Ohio, and I was really kind of, the idea that I had for this talk was, how can I communicate to people that don't come from a web development background how they can get started, or what, what are some things that they need to understand? Sort of fundamental levels, but then I, I also wanted to appeal to the, you know, the long-time front-end developer crowd that maybe doesn't have a lot of the deep knowledge of the abstractions in the browser. And so I found this article by Callie Garciel and Paul Irish on HTML5Rocks.com, and it was about how browsers work. And it was really, really in-depth. Uh, you know, it's, it's definitely a huge article, and you should totally read it. Um, and a lot of the material from uh, that article I've uh, taken and shaped into the way that I want to present here. And so I actually emailed Tally uh, and Paul and Tally got back to me and said, yeah, you know, no problem. You can use um, stuff from my presentation. Just put a put a slide in, giving credit back. So a lot of the stuff that you're going to see um, in this talk is definitely from, from the article on how browsers work and you should take the time to read it. There's more scope there than what I can cover in this presentation. Um, but I think 
the goal here is to pick the uh, the low hanging fruit, the things that you should understand. So this is kind of our lesson plan. This is what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna look at uh, understanding how browsers work. Um, we're gonna look at some tools that um, you can use and some best practices. Those are basically the three main goals. And we're gonna deep dive into the guts of browsers. So as I'd been uh, sending this talk out to presentations, uh, one of the things that I put in the description was that browsers are the most volatile programming environment the world has ever known. And I think that definitely des deserves some qualification. Um, but if you think maybe you came from a background where you write lots of Java uh, and you, the JDK is your platform that you write for, um, the JDK you know, definitely doesn't move uh, super fast. There's a huge um, committee of people that ratify standards for features that make it into the JDK. Um, and that platform is relatively stable. It takes a long time for things to develop there. Maybe you write uh, .NET applications and you run things on the common language runtime, the CLR. Um, again, you know, a platform that is relatively stable, uh, that doesn't have, uh, it's not burdened with things like backwards compatibility for the most part. And so when you look at those platforms and compare as web developers writing for the browser and you think about Chrome is on release 21 or 22 now, Firefox is playing catch up, they're on release 16. I mean, Internet Explorer, thank, thank goodness, has started to play catch up and they're on you know, revision 10 coming out right away. But the, the rate of change in the release of those platforms is just skyrocketed. I mean, we're seeing releases come sometimes two and three week increments. And that, all of that combined with the fact that uh, when you're building web applications, your platform is not just one target, or it shouldn't be anyway. Uh, you shouldn't be deploying for just uh, Internet Explorer, for example. Um, that, all of that stuff adds up to why I think the browser is the most volatile programming environment the world has ever known. And so all the more reason to really gain a deep understanding. And this is what Paul Irish has to say in the HTML5 Rocks article on how browsers work. And I'm just gonna read it because it's a really good quote and I think it frames the rest of, of what I wanna talk about. So as a web developer, learning the internals of browser operations helps you make better decisions and know the justifications behind development best practices. And I mean, that's exactly, when I read that statement, I was, I was thinking, yes, you know, that sums up exactly what I wanna communicate to um, server-side devs who are coming to front-end development or people that are just new to front-end development so that they can understand the abstractions uh, so that when they hear best practices they're not just going to repeat them without understanding but they'll have the knowledge of well this is why the browser does this and this is why I use this best practice. So in order to do that I'm going to kind of take you through a bit of a deep dive um, into some of the areas of the browser. We're going to start with looking at um, the the UI, all of these uh, pieces are just high level components that are in the browser and we're going to touch on a few of them, not all of them. Uh, we'll take a look at the UI, we'll take a look at the browsing engine and the rendering engine, uh, we'll talk a little bit about network stack and the things that are important for you to know as a front end dev, a few things about the JavaScript engine uh, and the UI back end I probably won't touch on at all, it's just listed here as sort of the high level view. So the first thing that you need to know uh, when you're talking about a browser is, you know, imagine that uh, you're the browser and somebody has requested a document from you um, and that document needs to be served up over a network um, and then there's all these processes that need to happen and the main process that happens or the main sort of set of processes in, a, in the life cycle of returning a resource to a user if you're the browser is called main flow and it's made up of four things parsing HTML, um, building a DOM tree, building a render tree and then finally layout and painting so that visually the user can see what's on the screen. We'll take a look at the, the, the pieces highlighted in yellow here to start with. Um, and it's important to understand uh, a bit of a general idea of parsing, so let's start there. So when you're talking um, generally about parsing, you've got some input, you've got lexical analysis, you've got syntax analysis, and then you've got output. Um, that's just the general idea of parsing. And uh, lexical, lexical analysis is where the input is broken into 
um, tokens, uh, which are defined by the language's vocabulary. And syntax analysis uh, is basically where those are, there's rules in the syntax that are applied to the tokens to get you the output. And in order for parsing to work in this general sense, um, the language that you're parsing has to have what's called a context-free grammar. So let's take a look at a simple example. This is something called Bacchus Nower form. And when I was reading the HTML5 Rocks How Browsers Work article, I came across this. And it was interesting to me uh, because I'd never really sort of dug down into the deep guts of what languages are made up of. But I think it's definitely uh, worth looking at. So this is basically um, using BNF to express a simple language. Um, so given some input, 2 plus 3 minus 1, we would want to express our language in uh, regular expressions. So we've got an integer, integers in this language. We've got two symbols, plus and minus. And the bottom piece um, is the syntax, which is actually written in BNF. So if you take a look, the language is comprised of expressions, which is a compound term. Um, you've got terms and operations and terms. Uh, and those pieces are listed below. So the operations in our language that we're going to parse are plus and minus, uh, and the terms that we're dealing with um, can be an integer or an expression. So you can see how all those pieces kind of fit together to define you know, this very simple language and parsing. And so this language can be fully expressed in BNF, back as now our form, and so it's what's called uh, a context-free grammar. And the reason this is important is because when we go over to look at parsing HTML, um, it's a little bit different. So in, in going back to the scenario where you're the browser and somebody's requested a document from you, um, the, the process that happens when you're parsing HTML, there's a tokenizer uh, that breaks apart the, the input uh, into the token. So these are the tags that you're going to see in your web page, uh, your h1, your head, your body, HTML tags, all those things. Once the tokenizer has done that, um, there's this tree construction algorithm that happens that is going to take those tokens and stick it into this giant tree called the DOM tree. And the DOM stands, stands for Document Object Model, and it's basically the, the interface um, by which JavaScript uh, interacts with um, that DOM tree. And the thing that's important here is uh, this differs because Normally, parsing is easy, um, but parsing HTML is definitely not easy because uh, we don't have a context-free grammar. And so uh, basically, the syntax of HTML can't be entirely expressed in VNF. And there's a few reasons for this. Um, the first is that the HTML definition uh, is actually not defined in um, BNF, it's defined in doc types that the W3C provides. You might be familiar with uh, some of the older doc types. Strict, um, there's an XHTML doc type, there's transitional, uh, there's different revisions of HTML4. Obviously, the newest one that we look at using is the HTML5 doc type, which is just doc type HTML. And so the vo vocabulary and syntax of HTML, they're defined by those specs um, that the doc types that are created by the W3C. And so the thing that's unique about these um, is that browser uh, vendors are required to implement uh, their, their engines in such a way that all of the previous revisions of HTML are supported. So backwards compatibility is a huge um, part of be, you know, being a browser vendor. And this introduces the context into the equation, into the parsing equation, and it's one of the main reasons that HTML can't be parsed uh, traditionally. So another reason that HTML uh, parsing is difficult is because it's designed with forgiveness built in. Uh, browsers don't barf if you, for example, don't close your tag at the end. If you don't close all your div tags, they will basically try and do their best job to assume what you meant uh, and continue parsing. Um, and the reason for this is that HTML is uh, specifically designed to be forgiving so that it's very easy to author. This isn't the case with other programming languages where something as simple as a missing semicolon or a missing comma, uh, as in JavaScript, can trip up your entire application and send things spiraling out of control and often it's hard for uh, new developers to figure out why. So the other reason that parsing is different or difficult uh, 
um, when considering browsers is the fact that um, there's script execution going on under the hood that is actually modifying the input at the same time. Um, and this is probably one of the only scenarios, uh, parsing scenarios, where this happens. And it's also one of the reasons browsers are incredibly complex. Um, we've got this loop going on where the tokenizer uh, is you know building the tree, which is going to build the DOM, but then in the middle, maybe you have some scripts, and they're executing and they're manipulating that tree. And so the browser has to be smart enough to say, well, that, you know, there's scripts that come in the middle because browsers parse things linearly from top to bottom, and there's a script sitting here in the middle, and it's modifying that input. So we need to you know make sure that our algorithm is up to date. The tokenizer has all the tokens if the script is injecting tokens with document.write and things like that. And it's for this reason, really, that parsing HTML is iterative. And it's also another reason why parsing must block or stop um, when reading JavaScript. And so with that in mind, with our look at the general sense of parsing um, and how languages can be fully expressed in BNF, then parsing becomes very easy because it's just a bunch of machine rules that are generated. Uh, looking at how browsers parse, how the input is continually modified, now maybe it, it might make more sense when we hear the best practice, well, we should move our scripts to the bottom of the page. By doing that, we actually give the browsers uh, a bit of a hand to limit the amount of variability introduced while parsing is happening. And with the scripts at the bottom of the page, um, the parsing will ideally have been mostly completed by the time they're reached, uh, and we will have helped speed up the parsing process. So when you hear people tell you, move scripts to the bottom of the page, now you can tell them that you understand why, because of the parsing loop, um, because of JavaScript manipulating the DOM on the fly. So we've talked about um, parsing in terms of how browsers work. Let's look at uh, the DOM in specific. Uh, we talked about uh, the tree um, that was being consumed by the browser. And it's basically an in-memory representation uh, of the document that you're going to parse. And it acts as an interface. I talked about that a little bit before, but the DOM is basically the interface by which the outside world can act on that uh, in-memory tree, and that's obviously via JavaScript. So let's recap. We took a look at parsing HTML. Um, it's complex, it's continuous, and it's forgiving. It's complex because the input is consistently being modified by JavaScript on the fly. Um, it's continuous. It doesn't. It's not a single pass parse. Uh, it's basically a loop that runs. Uh, and because HTML is designed with forgiveness in mind for authors, parsing becomes incredibly context, context sensitive uh, due to all the backwards compatibilities that browser vendors have to support when they're building their browsers. So that takes care of parsing HTML in the DOM tree in the main flow. So let's take a look at um, the next set of trees that the browser builds, and this is the render tree. So we talked about parsing HTML, um, and now let's take a look at parsing CSS, uh, just briefly. Um, parsing CSS, the output of parsing CSS is a style sheet object, um, and it's also a tree-like object. Um, but the difference between parsing HTML and parsing CSS is that CSS, uh, the syntax of CSS, is fully capable of being expressed in Bacchus Nara form, BNF. Uh, and so it's, as a result, it's a lot easier. Let's look at the vocabulary. And I think one of the things that I find, uh, I guess, revealing about this is before I put together this talk and started doing research about this and, and read the How Browsers Work article, uh, you know, I, there were things about CSS that just sort of confused me. Um, but if you take the time to sort of dig into the nuts and bolts of it and look at something like this, which is the vocabulary defined in regular expressions, you can see that there really isn't a lot of complexity um, in the vocabulary. We've got a lot of language features, or a lot of pe features in the vocabulary that uh, are similar to other languages. We've got comments, um, you've got numeric, you've got uh, non-ASCII characters, numbers, characters, um, and names and idents. And you can see here the engineer is telling us that the idents is short for an identifier like a class name, and a name is an element ID basically referred to by the hash. So given that we've got the vocabulary uh, for CSS defined uh, this easily, Let's take a look at the grammar, which is also pretty simple when you break it down. So CSS um, is comprised of rule sets, which consist of 
one or more selectors with one or more declarations. And a selector can be either a simple selector, a combinator selector, or multiple uh, combinator selectors. A simple selector is something like an element name, um, either a hash, uh, the class selector, so hash would be an ID, class selector being the dot, attribute selector being an HTML attribute selector, and then pseudo selector like hover. Classes start with the dot, uh, element names, attributes, and pseudo selectors. Those are all listed there. So I mean, not, not really a lot of pieces that uh, make up the CSS grammar. Let's dig a little bit deeper into um, the CSS rule sets. So this is an example of a rule set. Uh, in this case, the rule set is selecting, it has some, two selectors, one for div.error and one for a.error. That is a div element with a class of error and an a element with a class of error. And this rule set has multiple declarations. In this case, color red and font weight bold. And so when we're talking about uh, parsing CSS, we can basically understand that um, parsing HTML yields, yields a document object, parsing CSS yields a style sheet object that consists of uh, multiple rules, which are comprised of multiple selectors and multiple declarations, each with their own property and value. So let's recap on parsing CSS. It's a lot simpler than HTML because it's automatic. Browsers actually use something called Flex and Bison, which are parser generators, uh, and they basically look at the vocabulary of CSS um, and automatically generate a parser for it. Uh, there's a single pass that happens with parsing CSS because there's nothing modifying the input on the fly, and as a result, it's a lot simpler. JavaScript, on the other hand, is a little bit more uh, difficult and there's a couple of key characteristics that I think we need to understand uh, about the way browsers parse JavaScript and other external resources uh, in general. So parsing occurs synchronously, um, so the order of inclusion of scripts matters. There's also something called a speculative parsing thread, which we'll take a look at. Um, and there's this idea of you know whether browsers are single-threaded or not that I think is often confusing to uh, new developers to the front end, so we'll take a look at that as well. So the first thing we really need to understand is um, processing order. I talked about how browsers parse things from top to bottom linearly. Um, and so browsers are synchronous uh, in processing these, these assets, but they do some optimizations um, to speed this up. The thing that I think is, is confusing to people is this idea of threading. And I've heard it said that you know browsers are single-threaded, um, and I think that that is uh, maybe not true. Um, browsers definitely render in a single thread, and I think the distinction is important to understand, and we'll take a look at why. So at the heart of every browser, there's this thing called the event loop. This code is basically from, uh, I believe, WebKit or Firefox, I forget which one. Um, the Gecko rendering engine, I think. And the main thread uh, in the browser, there's one thread, one main thread, uh, it's basically an infinite loop. And as long as the user hasn't closed the browser, um, it'll basically keep processing events. And Firefox and Chrome handle these things differently. And for the purposes of the HTML5 rocks article and for this talk, we're looking at Chrome and Firefox, mostly because the source code for those is available publicly. Um, and the other reason is Internet Explorer is closed source. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, I think it's suitable to, to understand uh, Chrome and Firefox. I actually contacted uh, Tally about some of the materials in, in the article, and she said some of it was outdated, but I think uh, a lot of the fundamentals still apply. And so uh, two different optimizations for handling um, threading and the process. Uh, Firefox has a single main thread, and it handles processing events in an event loop. And Chrome is a little bit more granular in its optimization. Uh, includes a separate main thread for each tab that you open. So if you actually open up your Process Explorer when you're running Chrome, uh, whether you're on Windows or Mac or Linux, you'll actually see a separate process uh, in that list for each tab that you have open. And so continuing on with this idea of single-threadedness, um, the exception to the rule, because there's always exceptions, exceptions to every rule, is that everything uh, except network operations happens in a single thread. 
Um, and the reason for this is, as I mentioned before, something called speculative parsing. So if you imagine on the left we have um, our main thread, uh, I'm the browser, somebody's requested a document from me, so uh, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna serve that up and there's HTML in there and then there's JavaScript that's included from an external resource. There's style sheets that are included and there's images. And so the optimization that browsers do uh, is they have this main thread that goes through and but they have this speculative thread that fires up in parallel that goes through and says, hey, I detected an external resource. And the responsibility of the speculative thread is basically to load those assets over the network, not to parse them, just to load them. So parsing happens all in the main thread. The speculative thread is only for loading external resources uh, in parallel so that the optimization is done so that by the time the main thread hits those external resources, they're already cached in memory, they're ready to go, they can be parsed, uh, and the browser doesn't have to wait on that network latency. Uh, to get those resources. And so this brings up an interesting question. What if uh, my scripts ask for style information during parsing? And you wouldn't think it's such a big deal, but uh, it really is. It's significant enough that um, Chrome and Firefox both handle this differently. They have slightly different optimizations. So Firefox actually blocks all the scripts when a style sheet is being loaded and parsed. And Chrome um, blocks scripts only when they try to access certain style properties that may affect, be affected by unloaded style sheets. And so the reason this, this is important is uh, if, um, if your JavaScript is executing uh, and it's asking for style information, but the browser hasn't parsed um, all of the style sheets yet, uh, then the style information that you get might be out of sync. And so that's the reason these optimizations happen. So let's talk about our parsing recap um, of JavaScript uh, and external assets and resources. Um, it's speculative. There's a speculative thread. Um, it's synchronous, uh, except for the fact that a parallel um, speculative thread runs to fetch uh, external resources. Um, the order of inclusion matters, given that browsers parse from top to bottom. And ultimately, browsers are single-threaded. They render in a single thread. Um, but they do use multiple threads uh, when it comes to fetching network, as network resources. Cool. So we talked about parsing uh, HTML. We've talked about building the DOM tree. We've talked about parsing CSS and JavaScript and external resources. Uh, and then basically, once that is all done, the browser can go on to building the render tree. And the render tree is basically responsible for helping the browser determine all of the visual elements that are displayed in the viewport, which is the big thing below the address bar in your browser that displays all of the contents to you. And so there's these render objects that have to get created. Um, and the type of each render object uh, is determined by the display style attribute for a node. So when you're looking at your style sheet and you see display block, um, that's a block render object, block renderer, that's going to be applied to that node. And so there's some complexity in how browsers figure this information out. Here's a look at uh, the display attribute and what kind of renderer um, it's going to trigger. So you can see that uh, in the case of none, there is actually going to be no render renderer applied to it. Uh, in an inline, you're going to have an inline renderer, block triggers a block, uh, and so on. There's multiple different types of renderers for each node uh, that is going to get added in the, the render tree construction phase. So the interesting thing about the render tree is while the DOM tree, which you can see pictured here, has a bunch of different nodes in it, um, the render tree uh, can actually have multiple nodes that point, multiple render renderers that point to this the same object in the DOM tree. So for example, you can see here that uh, an HTML uh, element in the DOM tree has three renderers applied to it, a viewport renderer, um, a scroll renderer, which gives the vertical scroll bar, vertical and horizontal scroll bars, and a block renderer. And you can see all of the other elements here have different renderers. Excuse me. And so other examples that might uh, include DOM nodes or DOM, DOM elements that would have multiple renderers would be like a select element, which has three renderers, one for the display area, one for the drop-down list, and one for uh, the button on the select. And so constructing this render tree um, requires calculating all of the visual properties of each of these nodes. 
uh, and this is done by calculating the style properties. And it's super important to understand how style computation works because it's often a source of misconception for front-end developers. So the first thing you need to know is that style sheets or style information uh, comes from four different places. Uh, it comes from something called a browser style sheet, which is a default style sheet that every browser vendor includes. So Firefox has its own default style sheet, Chrome has its own uh, Internet Explorer, etc. And basically, if you were to create uh, an HTML page with no styling information at all, um, the default values that you'd see, for example, if you had a, an unordered list, you'd see bullets. If you had an ordered list, you'd see numbers beside each of the list items. And that information about where that styling information comes from, the browser default style sheet. Uh, you can also have user style sheets, which um, individual users can add style information. Uh, there's also author style sheets, which are the things that you and I add to our web pages. And then there's inline styles. Um, as you can see in the example here, the, uh, the paragraph tag has a, an inline style with setting the line height to 10 pixels. And so understanding where all those things come from, uh, those sources, it's probably easy to wonder how in the heck browsers make any sense of the information given that it comes from so many different places. And that's absolutely true. Style computation is very hard. Um, so let's take a look at uh, how the browser is going to figure out um, style computation and why it's why it's so hard. Um, style data is huge, absolutely huge, especially when you're dealing with multiple sources for style information. So it's very large. The rule matching algorithm that the browsers go through to determine what rule applies to what node in the render tree uh, is very heavy. Um, and then you know we talk about CSS cascading style sheets. We often talk about style sheets and forget about the cascade, but the cascade makes things incredibly complex. Uh, it's actually one of the the maybe design features of CSS that um, it's powerful, but I don't know if, uh, if it was as well thought through as some of the other features um, in browsers. So let's take a look again at the style sources. We talked about browser default style sheets, user style sheets, things that users can include, author style sheets, and inline style sheets. So that's just where they come from, but how does the browser actually determine um, which rules get applied? And that's done with something called the cascade priority. So you can he see here from top to bottom, uh, lowest to highest priority. So we've got browser style sheets uh, come at the lowest priority. If you don't have anything else, browser style sheets will apply. Um, if users have style sheets with normal declarations, then those will be applied and author style sheets with normal declarations uh, will trump user style sheets with normal declarations. And so what do I mean by normal? I mean any um, style declaration that doesn't have the bang important after it. And I'll talk a little bit later about bang important and why it's probably um, not the greatest thing to, to rely on. But it's good to understand how the rules apply. So when you go to style rules with bang important in them, uh, the priority flips and author style sheets um, come second and the thing that trumps everything is user style sheets. And so this le leads to a best practice that you may have heard which is don't use CSS resets. And this might be controversial for some people uh, because resets uh, have gained in popularity. My, my thinking is uh, browsers all have a default style sheet that already provides some default properties. And given that we know that it's very heavy to compute style information, given the number of sources, given that the algorithm for um, doing the rule matching is heavy and that the amount of data is very large, um, if you add a reset, you're effectively zeroing out, this is what most resets do, they zero out all of the rules uh, or all of the style information so that browsers have a new baseline. So the proposed benefit is that you get a new starting point that is probably um, the same across all of the browser vendors. But at what cost is, is I guess what I'm saying. And so that's why I say the best practice is don't use CSS resets because in using them, uh, you're, you're adding to the performance overhead and in some cases it can be extreme. So my rule of thumb, again, this is my personal rule. Uh, if you must use a CSS reset, you should probably use the same one and normalize.css is probably the best option for that. So we looked at uh, the sources for where style information comes from. We looked at the cascade priority so that browsers have a preliminary sense of how to determine what rules apply to what nodes. And um, now I think we should...
probably, oh, I talked about uh, important. And so one of the other best practices is about limiting important. And so with the discussion of that uh, and some understanding of how it works, um, I think I should just explain this best practice a little. Nicole Sullivan, who is uh, Stubbornella on Twitter, and I've got some slides coming later with, with her information. You should definitely follow her, and she's got tons of great articles. She's got an article on CSS best practices, and she talks about how it's easy to end up in, in an arms race um, about who can make the rules the highest priority. So we know that uh, adding bang important makes our rule the highest priority, and the browser's going to apply it, given that we are our authors, and that users can override that with bang important. Uh, the, the trouble I see is that in large projects and large teams, um, most often people don't take the time to really understand the cascade and that priority, and so what they do is they'll get frustrated, especially on a project with lots of, lots of templates. You know, you've got 10,000 JSP files or whatever language you're working in, and so the typical mindset of the developer is, okay, I can't figure out how this rule is applying to this widget that I'm working on, and so I'm just going to put bang important on it and call it a day. And the, the problem there is that everybody on the team ends up having to do that um, because they've basically gone to uh, the highest priority declaration in their rule, and the cascade is basically neutered, uh, and it can't have any effect anymore. So definitely you should limit your use of important uh, and try to avoid it altogether. You can find a lot of more good information uh, at this, this link in the bottom. So let's look at um, the anatomy of a rule, uh, because given the source of styling information and the cascade priority, there's also uh, some information uh, about rules that browsers use to determine which um, piece of style information applies to which node. So a rule is made up of a selector, here we have the, the H2 element, with um, one or more declarations. So the declaration consists of a property and a value. So in this case, there's two declarations, one color blue and one margin 1 em. And the property is color and the property is margin, and the value is 1 em and the value is blue. So understanding that, um, we can come to the point now where browsers might um, have figured out where the styling information is going to come from, which one of those style sheets, uh, which rule is going to apply given the priority of the cascade, but what if those things are the same up to that point? Uh, this leads us to look at how browsers have to deal with conflicting CSS rules. And this comes to something called specificity, which is uh, an often confusing topic for developers. CSS is kind of like this really misunderstood thing that uh, you know developers who don't take the time to understand really just poke at uh, and do things like put bang important on all of their rules. And so let's look at specificity. Um, there's a classification for uh, the selector portion of a declaration. And the selector consists of a ranking, uh, which is sort of like a hierarchy. And so there's a weighting that is applied to uh, each piece of the selector. And so this weighting um, is applied as follows. Inline styles take the highest priority or the highest weighting. That's, that's the A in this equation. Um, next comes something with an ID, uh, then would be something with a class, and then element selectors like div and PNA. And so the critical thing to understand here is that no matter how many ID selectors you have in your style sheet rule, if there's an inline style tag or inline style attribute on the element, that's going to override your IDs. And I think there's probably some edge cases to this. Like I heard recently that Internet Explorer has an upper limit of 256 classes in a single selector, and after that, funky things happen. But uh, if you're using 256 classes in a single selector, there's probably other problems that you have. So anyway, if if uh, if you can't figure out why your rule is not applying that you're adding to your style sheet. Uh, maybe you have an inline style, which is another reason why you should avoid inline styles. Uh, it really makes it hard to um, to manage uh, large projects. So no matter, likewise, no matter how many um, classes you have on an element, if you have an ID selector and a rule is overriding something in your class selector, that ID selector is going to take precedence. It's ranked higher in specificity, and no matter how many div P, A, no matter how many element selectors you have on uh, in the inner style sheet rule, um, a class will override that. 
So let's look at computing the specificity or a, a way to compute a, a numeric value so that you would be able to take a look at two arbitrary rules and compare them. Uh, so here's that H2 selector and it's comprised of one uh, element selector. And so if we basically add up the number of elements, classes, IDs, and inline style attributes, we can, can calculate the specificity. In this case, it's just one. Here's a little bit more complex an example. Uh, we have a, a rule set that is defined with a selector that has an ID selector, uh, a class selector, and an element selector. And so we would just tally those up and get 0, 1, 1, 1 as the specificity for this. And so if you were comparing this to another selector and you computed the specificity and its specificity value was higher, then that's the rule that the browser would apply to the, the element in the render tree. So there's another interesting um, piece about computing specificity is that as a human, I would read this uh, in English from left to right and it would say, I want to select the header element and then inside of there, I want to select the island, the element with the class of island, uh, and then I want to select uh, any anchor elements inside of that. But uh, that's not how the browser reads um, CSS rules it actually reads them from right to left. So the browser would say in English, I want to select all of the anchor elements that exist with a parent that has a class of island that exist with a parent uh, with an ID of header. And this distinction is important because it gives us some clues about um, performance and how to write uh, good selectors. And one of the best practices is to avoid the use of element selectors um, and use classes more because uh, you can see that the browser first has to select all of the anchor elements, um, then it has to select any elements with a class of island and any elements with an ID of header. Selecting all of the anchor elements on the page is pretty inefficient. And so Stubbornella, Nicole Sullivan, who I talked about earlier, she, she has this best practice um, based on the knowledge of how browsers read rules and specificity. Classes are your friends. Seeing a lot of IDs is very bad. And you try to find the middle ground where all the repeating visual patterns can be abstracted. And you also want to keep specificity as low as possible. The interesting thing about this quote is that if you come from a server-side background, uh, you might be familiar with something called good object-oriented design. And I think that uh, server-side developers or back-end developers pride themselves on good object-oriented design. Uh, but if you look at the highlighted words in this, um, it talks about a lot of the things that are the same. Uh, abstracting uh, visu repeated visual patterns, keeping specificity as low as possible, don't, you know, the idea of dry, don't repeat yourself, all of these things apply. And if you want to do more reading on object-oriented design as it pl applies to uh, CSS, Nicole has some awesome articles um, that I think if you just Google object or OOCSS, object-oriented CSS, uh, you'll find some stuff there. So we've talked about uh, sources for different style information. We've talked about the cascade and the priority of how the browser applies those rules. We've talked about specificity and computing uh, so that the browser can determine which rule set applies to a particular node in the render tree. Uh, and we talked about some conflict resolution there, but what about multiple rules having the same specificity? And this is where conflict resolution gets a little bit more hairy. And so the order of conflict resolution is the browser says, you know, given that the rules got the same specificity, does it have the bang important attribute on it? Uh, if it does, then it'll apply. It goes down the list and then says, um, where's the origin of the style rule? Did it come from an author style sheet, a user style sheet, or a browser style sheet? What's the specificity? Uh, and if those are the same, what's the source order as the last resort? So you can sum it up like this. If two declarations have the same importance, origin, and specificity, the latter specified declaration wins. So that's a lot of things to keep in your head as a web developer. Um, luckily, there's some really good tools out there. Uh, Firebug was kind of the pioneer in this regard. You'd get the, um, the style pane inspector, and you could actually see the cascade at work, see which rules applied, see which rules were overridden. Uh, the Chrome inspector uh, now does this as well. Um, and so it's easy to see and easy to visualize, but I think even if you can't visualize, uh, it's just something that's good to understand from a fundamental level so that when you're building style sheets, um, you don't just put bang important everywhere. Uh, you actually think about 
how the rule that you, the, the specificity of the rule you're crafting is going to impact performance and things like that. So we've taken a look at parsing HTML, we've looked at the DOM tree, we've looked at the render tree, and now we need to talk about layout and painting, which is the last step that happens. Because up to this point, uh, if, the, if I'm the browser and uh, somebody has told me to go and fetch a document, I haven't actually rendered anything on the screen, and that's obviously the whole point of the exercise. So this is a visualization of something called reflow, uh, which is a process that all browsers go through in the layout and painting stage. Um, and there's a couple of interesting things to note. Uh, it starts from top to bottom, left to right, coordinate zero, zero, uh, and it's recursive. So um, parent renderers will invoke layout on their children, and depending on what the children, the contents of the children are, um, this process can actually change dramatically. And reflow happens in a nanosecond. This visualization, I'll just play it again, was slowed down. Uh, you know, thousands of times, and there are tons of things that cause reflow, um, basically cause the painting process to occur. And understanding uh, why this is and how it happens is key to um, a couple of other best practices that we'll take a look at. So here's the layout process. You know, we saw it in the in the visualization. Uh, there's a parent renderer which computes its width. Um, then it has to iterate over its children putting them at x and y coordinates. Um, browsers use something called uh, a dirty bit system. So uh, if the dirty bit is set on a renderer in the render tree, um, the browser will actually call a layout on that child. So it, it relays out uh, and recomputes the, uh, the layout coordinates. Once all the children are laid out, then the parent can actually compute its height uh, because the height of a parent element would be uh, as tall as the highest height of or the height of its tallest children, child. And then once it's done, it flips its dirty bit to false so that the browser knows if it's going to come back and iterate over this again. It doesn't have to relay out the node. So that's the layout process. And we talked about reflow. We looked at the visualization. Um, so what, what triggers reflow? Because there's quite a few things. So anytime you change the font size in a browser, it's going to trigger reflow. Anytime, anytime you change the screen size, uh, if you add or remove style sheets dynamically with JavaScript, you're going to trigger reflow. When users click into uh, and type into form fields, it's going to trigger reflow. There's renderers that uh, control the default style information there. If you hover over an element, you're going to trigger reflow uh, by changing a class attribute. Uh, anytime JavaScript changes the, the DOM, and anytime you compute the offset of a node to get the XY coordinates, you're going to cause a reflow. So given that reflow happens all the time, uh, it's computationally expensive, um, knowing that there's, there's some things that we can do to limit reflow, and again, I'm going to lean on Nicole Sullivan's best practices. Um, she has some really good ones here. Her first one, make changes low in the DOM. Reflows can be top to bottom. As reflow information is passed to surrounding nodes, reflows are unavoidable, but you can reduce their impact. Change classes as low in the DOM tree as possible and thus limit the scope of reflow to as few nodes as possible. For example, you should avoid changing the class on wrapper elements to affect the display of child nodes. Object-oriented CSS always attempts to attach classes to the object, DOM node or nodes, they affect, but in this case, it has the added performance benefit of minimizing the impact of reflows. So basically what Nicole's saying is that uh, if you have a pretty deep tree, um, you don't want to make changes at the top of that tree because that's going to trigger layout in all of the children um, that are below that node. So if you can, make your changes down here at the lower level. Avoiding inline styles. And I'm just going to read uh, what Nicole says because she says it a lot better than I could. Um, we all know that interacting with the DOM is slow. We try to group changes in an invisible DOM tree fragment and then cause only one reflow when the entire change is applied to the DOM. Similarly, setting styles via the style attribute cause reflows, so we should avoid setting multiple inline styles which would each cause a reflow. The styles should be combined in an external class which would cause only one reflow when the class attribute of the element is manipulated. So instead of using inline styles, which uh, is already a bad idea just due to the fact that it's a maintenance headache, um, it violates separation of concerns, uh, and it's just a real pain in the ass to, to fix. Um, you should avoid them and instead combine all that information that you're going to put into an inline style into a class element. Given that changing the class attribute of an element triggers a reflow, um, you can do that once instead of having inline styles 
all over the place, triggering a reflow. This one was kind of interesting, and I didn't uh, know about this until uh, a year and a half or two ago when I was researching this, but um, you should animate only fixed or absolute position elements. And Nicole says, apply animations to elements that are position fixed or absolute. They don't affect other elements layouts, so they will only cause a repaint rather than a full reflow. This is much less costly. And we'll take a look at uh, the layout of a node in just a little bit so that you can get some more context on that. But um, the rule of thumb is just if you're going to animate things uh, in the browser, you sh they should be position fixed or position absolute. And the last one, you know, probably doesn't need to be said given that uh, it's been beaten to death so many times, but you should avoid tables for layout. And here's what Nicole says about that. Avoid tables for layout. As if you needed another reason to avoid them, tables often require multiple passes before layout is completely established, because they are one of the rare cases where elements can affect the display of other elements that came before them on the DOM. Imagine a cell at the end of a table with a very wide content that causes the column to be completely resized. This is why tables are not rendered progressively in all browsers. And yet another reason why they are a bad idea for layout. According to Mozilla, even minor changes will cause reflows of all other nodes in the table. So given that we understand reflow, we understand that it's computationally expensive, uh, that browsers have to do a lot of work to figure out where to position elements, how to figure out which styling information, um, these are some best practices that you can take and understand um, given how they impact reflow and avoid them. So the next piece uh, that given that we know how reflow works and that we know how tips, some tips on how to limit it, um, we need to figure out how the browser actually computes uh, X and Y values for coordinates and width and height on its nodes. Uh, and to understand that we need to look at something called the box model. And internally, the browser describes every rectangle that it's going to build in the layout process using the box model, which consists of the inner content box that houses uh, a paragraph or image, uh, and then padding borders and margins are computed on the outside. And I think the reason it's important to understand the box model is uh, traditionally, you know, probably seven or eight years ago, um, when Internet Explorer differed greatly in the way that it computed the box model, it was a huge source of frustration for people. Uh, and it was the cause of so many different hacks for layouts. Um, it's a lot better now. Uh, Internet Explorer 9 and 10, even 8 is miles better than 5 and 6 and 7 were for a computing box model. So let's take a look at the different box display types. Um, we've got block, we've got inline, and we've got none. So that's not that many to, to consider. Uh, let's take a look at how they appear. So if I've got these two block um, renderers, they're going to stack vertically on top of each other, you can see them here. And if I've got inline renderers, those are going to stack horizontally. So block goes vertically, inline goes horizontally next to each other. Pretty easy. But then there's three positioning schemes that we have to, to understand. Um, there's a normal positioning scheme, and the positioning scheme is determined by uh, a couple of different attributes. The position attribute, um, and a value of static or relative will tr trigger normal positioning scheme. And a float attribute with left or right will trigger the float positioning scheme. And the position absolute or fixed triggers the absolute positioning scheme. So we've got three boxes, three blocks, box display types, none, block, and inline. And then three possible positioning schemes for each of those, normal, floated, or absolute. So let's take a look at how floats look. So when you have a, an element, in this case, uh, I floated an image to the right, you can see that uh, normally that would have been a block level element, but because we floated it, it actually removes it from the document flow uh, and places it uh, to the right. And that's what float does. And that's the um, float positioning scheme. Pretty easy to understand. The advantage of float is that uh, when you float an element, the rest of the content will flow around the element. Pretty cool. What about relative positioning? Relative uh, positioning is something that's somewhat confusing, um, but if I have uh, an inline element like this span, and I s set position relative uh, on the, the element, and I'm using an inline style here just because uh, I didn't have an frame in the slide, but you should always apply this kind of information with a class or an IDE selector in your style rules. But if I have uh, a span, which normally has an inline renderer applied to it, so it's going to stack horizontally, 
Um, position relative basically could have easily been called position offset because that's what it does. So it's going to be positioned relative to uh, its its neighbor, which is the span previous, and it's going to be offset by whatever is in the left uh, attribute. So left five pixels, that's position relative. And position absolute and fixed are somewhat different. So in this case, uh, I applied position absolute to um, box number three. And what that does is it actually removes it from uh, the normal inline render box that's surrounding one and two. Uh, and it will be positioned um, absolutely to its nearest parent, so the div block level element. And it will be offset by five pixels from the top and five pixels to the left. So that's what position absolute and fixed do. So the last thing we need to look at, uh, now that we understand how browsers apply style rules, how um, browsers figure out uh, X and Y coordinates, width and height, based on the three display types, none, block, and inline, and the three positioning schemes, normal, float, and fixed, we need to look at the painting process. And this is basically uh, a really quick overview of what browsers do. Um, when they actually draw those elements on the screen from front to back. And this is something called a stacking context. If you think about uh, z-index as a stacking context, it's basically the same thing, except this is before you get to z-index. So the first thing the browser processes is the background color, um, then the background images, then borders, then any children, and then the outline. There's a couple optimizations that uh, Firefox and Chrome do that are kind of interesting uh, to note. And uh, browsers, given that reflow is expensive, uh, given that uh, we want to limit it as much as possible, that's the reason for these optimizations. And so Firefox actually optimizes by um, not even computing elements that are going to be hidden beneath other elements on a repaint. So if you're familiar with uh, 3D graphics and the idea of occlusion culling, um, if you're the camera and you're looking at me, and you can see all these things, and you can see the shelf behind me, and maybe I put my hand behind my head. Firefox on a an, an X repaint for the frame of this video would optimize by not having to draw my hand, even though it exists. And Chrome does a slightly different optimization um, in that every time a, a layout or a render happens, um, and a new layout has to happen, uh, it converts uh, the diffs between um, the rectangles and will only render uh, the pieces that it needs to, the, the, the diff values basically. So it's a little bit more of a granular optimization. It's definitely interesting. Uh, and if you want to know more about sort of optimizations, there's a lot more in the How Browsers Work article. So at this point, um, we've kind of examined everything that we needed to or that we set out to uh, in Mainflow. We looked at parsing HTML, um, parsing in a general sense, and how parsing HTML is difficult uh, due to um, backwards compatibility, forgiveness built into the language, which makes it not context-free grammar, uh, and JavaScript being pesky and modifying our input on the fly. Uh, we looked at generating the DOM tree, and we talked about um, parsing uh, CSS and speculative parsing in the order of external resources. We looked at uh, the render tree and how uh, the browser needs to, to look at sources for style information and determine how which rules apply to which nodes in the render tree based on specificity, um, based on the importance of the rule, based on the origin of the rule, and then finally if all that matches uh, the source order of the rule. And then finally we looked at uh, layout and painting and how reflow uh, is a process that happens continually and it's expensive. Um, and given that we should attempt to eliminate it. We looked all throughout these areas at best practices. And uh, I think in general, uh, the goal of this presentation has been, been to give you um, understanding about some of the abstractions in the browser. And uh, I really hope that um, you will go check out uh, some of the articles listed at this link. Uh, there's a bunch of really good stuff from Nicole Sullivan, uh, from Paul Irish, from other people that have submitted to html5rocks.com, uh, really good resources. And I really hope that I've increased, uh, been able to increase your level of understanding um, on at least some of the abstractions in the browser and, and maybe given you some understanding around best practices uh, so that you can uh, 
move from being just a developer uh, who doesn't really understand the front end and the browser as a platform to an engineer uh, who really has a good grasp on uh, front end engineering and what it means to develop for the browser as a platform. Thanks.